well, Sully's on the couch and Scout may join us later. And I'll be honest right now, Bass and Esther are still asleep. Well, that was not an earthquake, that was Scout. We'll see what happens. But anyway, y'all are ready, I'm ready. I'm gonna tell you a story today about a lady named Mary Jemison. Now, way back in the dark ages in about 1975, when I was in the fifth grade, I can remember reading a book called Mary Jemison, Indian Captive. And I was just fascinated by this and then found out later it was a true story. It was about a young woman, a young girl who was captured by and raised by a group of Indians and lived the rest of her life as an Indian person, a Seneca person. So I want to tell you a little bit about that story because it's it stuck with me and it's always been sort of fascinating. Uh, Mary Jemison was born in 1743 on board the ship William and Mary. William and Mary had been the joint rulers, the king and queen of England. They were not still the king and queen of England, but they had been shortly before. <coughs> I think about 30 years before this, um, they, they had changed rulers, but they still had this ship named the William and Mary. Uh, her parents were Thomas and Jane Jemison, and they had two sons already named Thomas and John. They landed in Philadelphia and moved to the Marsh Creek Settlement, which was near present-day Gettysburg, and they built a cabin and began to form. Began to farm, sorry, not form. Um, the French and Indian War began in the spring of 1758, a party of French soldiers and Shawnee warriors came to Marsh Creek. The report that Mary tells later in her life is that the family was just getting ready to eat breakfast when they started hearing uh, gunshots and went out to see what was going on. They uh, were attacked by this raiding party. The two older boys, John, Thomas and John, escaped, but the rest of the family was captured. Now, depending on who you read, Mary was either 12 or 15. But based on the numbers that they give us, the years that they give us, and I can't find anywhere where they give us different years, she would have been 15. So she was 12 to 15, a, a young teenager, however you look at it. The raiding party headed toward Fort Duquesne, which is now Pittsburgh. That night, Mary and a boy from a neighboring family were taken away from the main group, and the rest of the family was killed and scalped. Thank you, Scout. You're a big help. Mary's mother had told Mary that if she were taken by the Indians not to try to escape, to do a good, you know, behave herself, be good, so that she would have a chance to live and not worry about the fact that um, something terrible may have happened to the rest of her family. Apparently the mother suspected that at some point this group was gonna decide to, to lighten their load and they weren't gonna need as many hostages and get rid of quite a few of them. Likely they kept Mary and this other young boy whose name I never did find because they were young enough to adopt into the tribes. The next day, Mary saw the scalps of her family being laid out to be dried and knew what had happened to them. So the, the party continues on and they get to Fort Duquesne. Mary was sold to a group of Seneca Indians and taken down the Ohio River. When they reached the Seneca village, she was adopted into a family. Her clothes and identity, her white clothes and white identity were discarded and she became, now I'm not sure how to pronounce this, so forgive me if I do it wrong, Degewanas, Degewanas, which again, you can find several different meanings for this. One says it means two falling voices, another says pretty girl, and another says it means a good thing. I have no idea what she means, but her name is always reported as the same word, Degewanas, but it gives various meanings to it. So I don't have it. I don't speak Seneca or Iroquois or whatever this, this group of people actually spoke. So I don't have any idea. 
Mary learned to live as a Seneca woman for a couple of years at least, and was reportedly treated very well. Now the story that I read said that there was at least one woman that kind of picked on her, but you're gonna get that in any, pretty much any group. There's always gonna be somebody that's not a nice person. But overall, she was treated well and came to view herself as a member of this tribe. She eventually married a man named Shenenji, who is reported as either a Seneca <clears throat> or a Delaware man. Again, it depends on which, which account you read. I think they just didn't keep really good records about various things like this back then. So, you know, you, you've only, you don't have a lot of information you can check for sure. With this man, she had a daughter who died about two days after she was born, and then a son named Tom, that she named Thomas after her father. Shenanji was worried that when the French and Indian War got over in 1763, that since the French and Indians had basically lost the war, he was worried that there was going to be a retribution and a move to find all of the people who, the white people who had been taken captive and made parts of Indian tribes at this point, and that they would have to go back to the white world and leave their Indian families. And he didn't want to lose his wife. And apparently she didn't want to go either. So he and Mary decided that they would move to his homeland, which was on the Genesee River in New York State. This was a journey of nearly 700 miles. So they began this journey in the summer. Mary and baby Thomas arrived during the winter of that year, but Shinji had become ill and died on the way. So he was not with them when they arrived in this, in this town. <clears throat> His family, however, <coughs> was very welcoming and they made a home for Mary at the Little Beards Town, which is the present day Kylerville, New York. This was the heartland of the Seneca people and the Seneca people were part of the larger Iroquois League, which was a group of five or seven um, Native American tribes that had joined together and kind of were like a nation among themselves. Uh, Mary eventually remarried um, a man named Ikatu, who is again reported as either a Seneca or a Lenape. All of these are tribes that were in the, the, the Seneca League, I'm sorry, the Iroquois League. So maybe that's where the confusion comes. Maybe people just didn't write down the, the real stuff. I'm not sure. But she remarried this man named Hikatu, and she had another six children with him, two sons and four daughters. She described her life during this time as very quiet and very peaceful. So she was apparently a happy wife and, and mother at this time. Um, the Revolutionary War began in 1776 and the Seneca and many other tribes sided with the British. In 1779, George Washington sent a group of 5,000 soldiers to destroy Little Beard's town and stop the Seneca from fighting. They knew that the Seneca in particular were hosting British officers in this town and, you know, letting them stay there and make plans and whatever. And so they decided that they were going to go and destroy this town and take that resource away from the British. As the soldiers approached, the Seneca had tried to lay traps for them, and all of this was unsuccessful. So as the soldiers approached the village, the Seneca all fled into the forest. Mary and her children <clears throat> went to the abandoned village of Gadaho, which was a little further away. Eventually, Hyakato found her, and they lived in the, the family lived in that village for nearly 20 years. After a while, after the war was over, the Revolutionary War was over, <clears throat> white soldiers, sorry, white farmers began to move into the area. And as usual, there were conflicts between the Native Americans and the white settlers who now wanted this land to farm on. So a great council was held in the summer of 1797. In the resulting treaty between the Seneca and the white people, much, much of the Seneca land was given to the white settlers. 
12 reservations were created for the Seneca, and one of them, the Gardot Reservation, included the village where Mary and her family lived. So they, their land was protected. They weren't going to have to move and you know, relocate to a different place. Uh, in 1807, Hikatu caught tuberculosis, which is a disease of your lungs. Uh, now we have medication for it, and it can be cleared up if you take the full course of the medication. Back then, if you got it, you were probably going to die. And it, it was a slow disease. It took years to die from tuberculosis generally. He died in 1811, but I think he was getting pretty old by then. Um, and you'll notice... Mary and Hikatu were married for over 40 years. So, you know, they, they, they must have had a, a decent relationship because Native Americans had different um, customs. And if in a lot of tribes, and I haven't researched the Seneca in particular, but in a lot of tribes, if a woman was not happy in her marriage, she could leave it and, you know, just dissolve the marriage and move on. And the man could as well. Neither of them did this, so they must have been reasonably happy with each other. Um, in 1811, her son John, who was a son from Hikadu, murdered his half-brother Thomas and his full brother Jesse a year later. Now, Mary reported when she was talking about this that John had been affected by his contact with the white people and had started drinking alcohol and had basically become an alcoholic. And she blamed a lot of what happened here on that, on the fact that he was an alcoholic. I, I don't know what happened to Jesse. I couldn't find that recorded. Um, mostly, Mary was a respected part of this community, and she was well-liked by her white neighbors. She was known as the Old White Woman of the Genesee, which is a terrible name. But some of her neighbors encouraged a writer to meet with her and talk to her because they thought her story was really interesting and it should be written down. So she met with this writer at a place called Wally's Tavern, in 1823, in November of 1823, and told her story. Later the next year, he wrote and published a book called The Life and Times of Mrs. Mary Jemison. Well, Bass has gotten up and he's apparently upset about something, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. In 1823, the Seneca gave up the Gardo reservation lands and were moving to a new area, but they left two square miles for Mary and her family. She sold the land in 1831 and moved to the Buffalo Creek Reservation. That's where she died in September, on September 19th in 1833. Mary was 90 years old, which is pretty old now and was really old back then. Uh, the since the, the the reservation lands began to fall down and they were not taken care of, she was buried in the reservation cemetery, which was not cared for as the reservation members died off. <clears throat> so in 1874, her grandchildren were concerned about the fact that she was in this place that was not being cared for, and they made arrangements to move her body to the Glen Iris Estate which was owned by Mr. Letchworth. And she was buried in a ceremony that blended Christian and Seneca beliefs. Her grave is, not, is now marked by a granite marker and a statue, and visitors are welcome to visit. So that's the story of Mary Jemison. Um, like I said, the, the book that I read was called Mary Jemison, Indian Captive. And... You might look in your school library if you're interested in the story. You might find something about it. There's probably more written about her at this point than just that one book. But um, I didn't do this with the PowerPoint like I've been doing in the past because, honestly, I couldn't find any pictures that I were, was absolutely certain were her. All of the pictures that I found were kind of romanticized, um, and I think they were produced much later. There were not cameras back then. Nobody could just take a photograph. And so it was just people drawing pictures and then painting them. And I couldn't find anything that I was absolutely sure was painted of her while she was alive. So I didn't put 
any pictures in. I will put a picture, uh, I did put a picture of the statue on the, the thumbnail of this piece so you can see the statue there. That's really all I have at this point. The cat seemed to be getting restless over there. I don't know what's going on. So I suppose that we're done for this week. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them for me. I hope that you have enjoyed this. Sully, I think we're going to be ready to go, and we will see you next time.